Father, we thank you that you are the guider and perfecter of our faith. That it's only in your will that we are truly free. So speak to us this morning as as your word is brought to us. Speak to us. Your people are listening. Amen. Have our first reading. Thank you. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Please stand. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise Christ the Lord. Father, may the words that I speak, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, There's a wee saying or a word that I heard recently. Uh, I thought it was just a normal male condition, but um, I've been let off the hook. I've been told it's called COVID brain. So it's not male brain where, uh, and you women have no idea what I'm talking about, do you? Um, uh, Male brain is where, uh, and, and uh, I did it this morning, uh, where you walk into the kitchen and you think, hang on a minute, why would I come in here? Now, there's a reason, there's a, hang on, I'm just going to pause, or, eh? is this an age thing? Oh, there you go. Thanks, Ant, I don't feel so bad now. But I was having this COVID brain um, as I was considering uh, the message for this morning, because I was wondering to myself, here we are, um, in the beginning of January, I was wondering to myself why we need to be speaking of Magi at this time of the year. And I'm thinking, surely Christmas is over. You know, suddenly Jesus has become 30 years of age in a matter of a fortnight, and we can get on with pondering Easter. It's certainly how it seems to me that we've, we've done the Christmas thing, so we can park that now and then move on and, and treat Jesus as an adult. And yet, and yet here we are still being encouraged uh, through our lectionary readings to still consider things, what we would th- speak of considering things of Christmas. I mean, how often do we see a Christmas scene where the shepherds and the magi are there together? <laughs> and a donkey. I mean, don't even get me started on the donkey. What's he doing there? Yet we need reminding and maybe even reinforcing that God is so determined to proclaim the good news of great joy for all people, as we read about in, in Luke 2, that God reaches beyond fields in the region around Bethlehem and he reaches as far as to the east, we hear of, where these magi come from. Um, maybe as far away as Persia. 
And what I started to consider was that God was reaching beyond shepherds. And shepherds, of course, are those who are at the bottom of the social barrel. And he's reaching to the wise ones who allegedly are at the top of the food chain. God reaches beyond people who are scared witless by God's glory. And we hear of that, don't we, from the shepherds who were petrified when the, uh, the heavenly host started singing. And he reaches beyond those to those who observe this glorious star as it's rising. And they methodically and they persistently and they sincerely follow the star until they come to a king. All along the way, God directs them. He directs them, first of all, by a star, and then by a verse from the prophet Micah. And finally, he directs them in their dreams. And so I'm starting to wonder to myself, hang on, maybe in my maleness that I've missed something. I've missed something in here because is it simply about these magi and kings? Or actually, is there something else going on here? So Christian tradition holds that the magi were kings. But in my research, it's probably a more precise description that the magi, because the magi belong to a priestly caste, and I'm going to try and pronounce this correctly, and somebody here with a theology degree could probably pronounce it better than I can. Zoroastrianism. Did I get it right? Ha! Phew. Tell you what. Zoroastrianism. You've got to use that twice in a sentence by the end of the day. What? Imagine you're sitting on the beach in Kaiteri Terry and you go, you know, I heard about Zoroastrianism today. And the people sitting beside you are going to go, wow, what's that? And you'll be going to go, I can tell you. So twice by the end of today, you need to use the word Zoroastrianism. Anyway, these guys paid particular attention to the stars. This priestly lineage gained an international reputation over the years for astrology, which was, at that time, highly regarded as a science. Where are you going with this, Russell? Well, they weren't kings coming to pay homage to another king. Neither were they theologians of the Torah or men of faith on a Mosaic pilgrimage. They weren't any of those things. These wise men from the East were scientists and they practiced other religions. And yet, God used their faith and their knowledge to bring them to the Christ. You see where this is starting to go? More ironic than that, God used these scientists who practiced these other religions to let King Herod and the chief priests and scribes know where the Christ was. And these were people who would have pompously declared that they were children of God. They would have called themselves that. God seems to do whatever it takes to reach out to and embrace all people. God announces the birth of the Messiah to shepherds through angels on Christmas, to Magi via a star on Epiphany, and to the political and religious authorities of God's own people through visitors from the East. From a manger where a child lays wrapped in cloth, God's reach is there. God's embrace in Christ Jesus gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It was just the beginning of things. The same Jesus eats with outcasts and sinners. The same Jesus touches people who are sick and people who live with disability. The same Jesus brings the dead back to life, for goodness sake. Ultimately, Jesus will, and friends still does, draw all people to himself as he is lifted up on the cross. In Christ Jesus, no one is beyond God's embrace. That's why I made it such a big thing this morning of getting ourselves sorted so that we can hear this word unencumbered by anything of the world. God's radical grace is wondrously frightening. As I wrote this, I actually had a bit of a shudder 
as I think of the implications that are of betraying the Magi this morning as scientists rather than as kings. Scientists, in fact, who practice other religions. Because to do so pushed me, and I hope it pushes you as well, to expand my understanding of both the ways that God reaches out to people to announce good news in and through Christ, and what means for individuals to have faith. Sorry, and what it means for individuals to have faith and what it means for gatherings of the faithful here in church. The Magi did not come looking for the Christ through preaching, liturgy, sacrament, a welcoming congregation, or a vital social ministry. Things I know that we all hold dear. They came seeking the Christ after studying the night skies. As someone who holds on to favoured favorite and cherished ways that God works to proclaim the gospel and bring people to faith, it's always wondrously frightening to realise anew that God's own work of embracing all people is more mystery than formula. Because God's ways are always bigger than my understanding. And yet, sadly, it seems so much safer and probably a whole lot easier to spend time in a sermon such as this, sentimentally propping up the traditional idea of solemn magi quietly arriving with camels and servants and valuable offerings and then reading some sort of meaning into the number and kinds of gifts that they bring. What a waste of good time. Yes, if I'm honest with myself, these days I sense God reaching out to embrace me in new ways. God is too often using late Saturday nights or early Thursday mornings or midday on a Tuesday helping me study the things around me of the new things that he may be doing. And he seems to do these kinds of things and more profoundly than he does early on Sunday mornings sitting in church sometimes. So even if, as I was writing these words last night, I worried about what the response to a sermon may be that was going to leave me basking in the light of Christ's star rather than worrying about the implications of Magi coming to faith outside of what we would call church or outside of our traditional formula or programmed approach of how faith is supposed to happen. But something in me says the way God brings people to faith, most often in spite of Christian best intentions, is really the good news of Christmas. The alternative, of course, is to join Herod in not seeing God's ever-expanding embrace or even feeling threatened by it and instead giving way to just plain fear. As we heard in Matthew 2, 3, when King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. Herod jealously reached out himself, yet just far enough to violently protect his place and preserve his power. We too can feel jealous when visitors showing up, show up seeking Christ due to experiences outside of our safe understanding and control. We have our own ways of reaching out and sadly too often just far enough to derail someone else's experience of God's intimate grace toward them as individuals. Loved for who they are and being met by God at their point of need, not ours. For the sake of our own patterns, practices and perspectives, we can put up our sh shutters of faith. And so the stage is set in this reading before us this morning for another liturgical year of proclaiming Christ, overcoming the conflict between God's ever-expanding embrace 
and our need to protect and preserve. A drama that will be resolved on the cross and a drama that is continuing to this very day. So friends, let us open the eyes of our hearts, unblock our spiritual ears, and try and look beyond our past and into God's present. And I'll leave you with this scripture from Isaiah 43, 19. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Amen. So as we come now into a time of intercession, let's take a moment and consider what God may be saying to us this morning. As Russell was speaking earlier today, this morning, I... um, I felt the Lord prompting me to give a word um, from the book of Esther. And I I believe this is for maybe for many people here, maybe for one person, I don't know. Um, But Esther was in a very dark place. Um, There were no believers around her. Her uncle was um, sort of looking after her and protecting her, but she Um, she was there to save the Jewish race and the place that she was put. And and so the Lord said to me, we're all in places where we would choose not to be. We all go to places. We work in places sometimes where we would choose not to be. Um, We're around people who are not believers. And so that's a hard place to be as a believer too. Um, And the Lord was saying to me that uh, you, you are there for such a time as this. Believe that you are there for such a time as this. And not only that, but as you seek favour amongst those people that you're with, that they will respond to you and they will ask you what are the desires of your heart and you will have the opportunity or what motivates you and you'll have the opportunity to share your testimony of your faith in a natural way as you have the trust of those those people who are not believers. So just be encouraged that we are where we are because God wants us there. It may not be where we think we should be, but we are there and God is with us there. Amen. That's a really good word right there. Yeah. A, a, a really good Some have said to me, so why do you do this testimony thing at 10 o'clock on us? Why do you do that, Just because we're practicing in a safe place. We're practicing in a safe place to bring our testimony. As Anna said, we're placed in a community who desperately need to hear that God is looking after us when we're driving home. We're, we're in a community that are looking for some desperate reason to get up in the morning. And we carry that hope in our hearts and in our testimony and who we are. So that's a good word right there. That God places us, and surely, if he is with us, never leave or forsake us. <coughs> As he said to Moses, don't worry about what you're going to say, I'll give you the words at the time. We just need to be obedient and start to talk and he will bring uh, a word to those. So that's a good word right there. Thank you, Anna, for sharing that. Well, let's continue.